Hi, I'm Ron Matson, and welcome to Learn the Bible in 24 Hours with Dr. Chuck Missler. Chuck will be taking you through some interesting oversights of the Bible and showing you some amazing facts. For more information on how you can join this group, click here. Well, we are entering hour eight of our Learn the Bible in 24 Hours, and this session is going to address the poetical books, as they're called. It's going to be a very different session. We've been in historical books, narrative type books. These are very different. The books are Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. And uh, very, very interesting books. Now, Job, of course, deals with the mystery of suffering. And, uh, or at least that's the way it is you know, commonly viewed. And it's the oldest book in the Bible, by the way. The oldest books are not by Moses. Uh, the book of Job was classic literature even in the days of Moses. Probably written some, something like uh, 2000 B.C., maybe even earlier. There are lots of studies. Some associate Job with Jobab, the son of Joktan in Genesis 10. But those are conjectures. There's a lot of debate exactly how far back he goes. But in any case, it is regarded, the book of Job is regarded as a literary masterpiece. It actually consists of very highly developed poetry. In fact, Victor Hugo called it the greatest masterpiece of the human mind. Well, you got that almost right. It's not of the human mind at all. <laughs> it's, uh, but in any case, uh, the book of Job, it's actually a dramatic poem framed in an epic story. And the first part of the book lets you in on something Job didn't have the benefit of. You need to understand as you read the book of Job, you, he, didn't ha he did not have the benefit of chapter 1. Because what happens in chapter 1 is a prologue where Satan challenges God. Job didn't know what was going on in heaven. And uh, following that, we have the dialogues. And there are actually four. We'll talk about three of them. Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Nabathite. And there's a fourth guy that's kind of a strange guy. Many people are puzzled by Elihu. I'll show you why later. Now, some of your people will probably, one of the little riddles your kid talk about, who is the shortest man in the Bible? And people say, well, Nehemiah would be the shortest guy in the Bible. <laughs> and when you hear that, say, no, no, it's Bildad the Shuhite. See? <laughs> see, if somebody says that uh, the centurion's the smallest guy because he slept on his watch. But that's another issue. Let's, let's get on here. And then the final part of the book is the divine response. We have a prologue, that's Satan's challenge, you need to understand, that sets the stage, but realize Job didn't know that. And then we have, and he goes through all these troubles, and the bulk of the book are these dialogues where these three friends, I'll put friends in quotation marks, um, discuss his predicament. But then God Himself steps in and answers for Job and to Job with a very remarkable passage. So the prologue. Now we first see Job in his, his piety in prosperity. He is very wealthy. He's got flocks. He's got wealth. He's got family. He is in great shape. And Satan uses that to accuse him. Satan goes before God and spreads his lie and his maliciousness by saying the reason he's so pious is because he's so rich. Take away his wealth and so forth, then see what happens. So God allows that to happen. And we see Job's piety in adversity as these things start to go against him. He doesn't lose his commitment to God. You get to his point where even his wife says, curse God and die. And though he slay me, yet will I trust him, is Job's response. And uh, Satan continues. Well, sure, he's still, but he, you know, let's take away, his, t take away his health. So we see his piety in adversity, but then his piety in extremity. He finally loses everything. He loses his... Uh, his uh, uh, he early, by the way, an important thing I should mention, he's regarded as the greatest man in the East. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, and 500 she-asses. So he was very prosperous. And uh, so uh, uh, Satan's the god of this age, right? Understand, Satan is real, and he's malevolent. He's against your best interests. In any case, finally, Job loses not only his wealth, and his family, his sons and daughters get killed. Seven sons and three daughters get killed. But he also loses his health. He's on, a, he's on a trash heap. He's in bad shape. 
And uh, then what const- uh, that's all in the first chapter. What constitutes the bulk of the book is these three friends that come and advise him. And every one of his friends, the arguments are valid, but they're not true. So with friends like that, you don't need enemies. And uh, see, but a couple of things, some insights in that early chapter. Satan is accountable to God. He can't touch Job unless God says, okay. Satan can only do things that God allows him to do. Every harm that comes to you is father filtered. It's interesting that Satan's dark mind is an open book to God. Satan has no secrets from God. Satan is also behind the evils that curse the earth. What's very clear as you study your Bible, the evils that are in the world are accountable to the God of this world, which is Satan. He's what it's all about in terms of evil. By the way, Satan is neither omnipresent nor omniscient. He has locality. He can't be harassing you when he's harassing you. In other words, his minions might. He's got resources. But he personally is a created being. He's not some kind of God. He is a very powerful angel uh, that's gone bad. So he's not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. Uh, I don't believe he can read your thoughts. He can implant thoughts in your mind, but I don't think he can read. Only God knows the thoughts and intents of the heart, the Scripture tells us. That's important to know. And Satan can do nothing without divine permission. Everything that happens, he has to go to God for permission. It's interesting also that God is always on his own. Little boy asks his dad, very nervous about something. He says, Dad, does, does God see me all the time? As if he's trying to hide something. The father very quickly says, God loves you so much that he can't take his eyes off you. Isn't that a great answer? I love that. So the dialogues constitute the bulk of this. Job's in this predicament. And we have three guys, and each guy gets three cracks at him. Three, three d- discourses. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time analyzing them. But Eliphaz basically advises Job based on his own observation experience. He concludes that Job suffers because he has sinned. They assume all these troubles are brought upon him because of his sin. That's basically the theme. Bildad comes along, and his primary argument is on tradition. And he concludes that Job is a hypocrite. It isn't what it seems. He somehow isn't as pious as it looks. Zophar comes along, and he rests on assumptions of orthodox dogma. Job is a wicked man. These dialogues are different only really in their subtleties. But they each take three, th- three, three attacks at him, and he responds, and that's what constitutes the bulk of the book. You finally get to this fourth guy, Elihu has sort of a different approach. And uh, see, all three of these guys preceding have too narrow a view and too rigid a view of God's providence. They don't have the understanding that God is big and has lots of different means and methods. But Elihu comes along, he, he, he sort of throws you because he's apparently a young man. and that, you, don't, you, know, you don't think of wisdom coming from a young man, but uh, he, he believes that uh, he, uh, he's sort of a very respectful intercessor on behalf of Job. And he has a higher view. He thinks suffering may have a higher purpose than they're allowing for. It may be, this may be moral rather than penal. This may restore rather than requite. This may chasten rather than chastise. In fact, he really sets the stage for God himself stepping in and answering for Job. When, jo- when God does step in, he rebukes the first three speakers. He rebukes them. that They, uh, they, they don't know what they're talking about. He doesn't come in Elihu. There are even some scholars that think Elihu could be an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. I don't go that far. But clearly, Elihu sets the stage. He's sort of an intercessor, sets the stage for God's appearance. But the divine response, you know, there comes a voice from a whirlwind, and God gives Job a science quiz regarding the earth, the heavens, living beings. He even talks about dinosaurs. Land dinosaurs and sea dinosaurs are mentioned in Job. Many people don't realize that because of all the silly speculations from commentaries. Don't read, the, don't read commentaries. Read the book and see what it set, talks about these things. And then there's the epilogue after he gives Job the sort of science. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And he talks about some interesting things we'll get here in a minute. That the epilogue, and then God rebukes the, the so-called three comforters. And then he restores to Job double everything he lost. There's a little surprise in that one too I want to get to. 
The scientific insights, you know, there are at least 15 facts of science that are suggested that were not discovered until recent centuries that are in the book of Job. It's an interesting passage, chapter 38 and following. One of the things that emerges out of all this is that the planet, the scientists have discovered, is uniquely designed for life. In fact, they call it the anthropic principle. It's as if the planet was designed for man. If the planet was a little bigger or a little smaller, life would be impossible. If it was a little close to the sun, a little further. If you try to build a model of the universe as we know it, you'll discover there are literally hundreds of factors that if you change them just a little bit, life's impossible. Forces and weights and ratios are all delicately designed. Example, the, those, the people say, gee, the ozone layer, if it changes one-tenth of one percent, cosmic doom comes. Turn that coin over. If it's that delicate, who balanced it? You see, each one of those arguments is an argument for design and also skillful attention. Some of those factors have one part in 10,000 different, and life's impossible. The nature of water, the water molecule, you go on and on and on, the, the so-called anthropic principle. It's a whole study in its own right, very fascinating. The other thing, the flip side of that is also the absence of scientific errors. You will not find any sci- in the Bible, you will not find scientific One of the amazing things is it doesn't have scientific errors. The, some of the f- silly folklore of the past doesn't creep in, except maybe idiomatically some places. But the hydrological cycle is a, a simple example. Evaporation, circulation, precipitation in Job 26. How, why do, how do clouds stay aloft? Water is heavier than air. How do they stay up there? Air, wind, so forth, have weight, right? Water weighs more than air, so how is it supported? You'll find the answer in, in uh, Job 28, among other places. There's also the space-time mass of the universe. We now know the properties of space. Empty space is not empty. It's got energy and so it has properties. It has any radio amateur tell you it has impedance. It, it has properties. Empty space has. He stretches out the north over empty space and hangeth the earth upon nothing, Job says. What? Hangs the earth on nothing? Well, we know that to be true today, don't we? The morning star is singing at the foundation of the earth. That's kind of interesting. They were created before the foundation of the earth. And these dinosaurs, that's another thing. People are fascinated with dinosaurs. You know, the land-based dinosaurs are represented by the behemoth in Job 40. It's not a hippopotamus. There's all kinds of conjectures. They don't fit the text. These are giant creatures. They're well described. If you, read, if, you, if you don't have in your mind trying to fit this to something we know and just listen to what the text says, what you'll see is a dinosaur with a big tail that knocks things over and is huge. And, by the way, here's the here's the breathes fire. Breathes fire. Now, that's bizarre. They have found skulls of dinosaurs that have chambers. They don't know what they're for. There's just a conjecture, we don't know, a conjecture that they may be very similar to the bombardier beetle, which mis- mixes two chemicals to throw fire. And we know, especially in Eastern Asia, there apparently has been a history of fire-breathing dinosaurs. That's what are called dragons in China and the rest. They had an ancient history. But there's also sea-based dinosaurs mentioned in Job 41, the Leviathan, and it talks about it. And it's interesting that these things may still be around in rare situations. In New Zealand, in 1977, some Japanese fishermen picked up this creature. It was 900 feet down. It was 32 feet long, weighed 4,000 pounds. Here's a picture of it. They didn't have the capacity to keep it. They took pictures of it and threw it back, but it's been well documented back in 97. And there have been others. This is just one that I happen to get a picture of. There are a number of these. Uh, Kent Hovind, his ministry, a number have all kinds of information on not only dinosaurs, but even contemporary I- encounters with them. Well, let's talk about astro- astronomy. God asks, where is the way where light dwelleth? You know, light's dynamic, dark, darkness is static. And uh, he, he, God asks him, get, just pick a sample here. God says to Job, can you bind the influences of the Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? That's God's challenge to Job. I was quite startled to discover from an astronomer friend of mine who pointed out that the constellations of the skies look like groups of stars, but obviously they're not real. Some are way very much further away, some are close. They just have a, an appearance that looks like they're not really necessarily clustered. There's only two exceptions. There are two constellations that, in fact, are gravitationally linked. The Pleiades and the Belt of Orion. How did Job, or the writer of Job, know that? God challenged him. Can you bind the influences of the Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? He knew. 
See, these are the only visible eye constellations in direct gravitational bondage. And they're mentioned in Job chapter 38, verse 31. In fact, the whole Matzeroth, what we call the Zodiac, are signs of God's plan of redemption. That's quite an ambitious thing to get into. I won't get into here. But you'll discover the 12 signs of the Zodiac, if known by their Hebrew names, portray the 12 tribes of Israel. And they also portray God's plan from the virgin birth, represented by Virgo, to the victory of the lion of the tribe of Judah, which we call Leo. All this gets corrupted in Genesis 11 at the Tower of Babel, but they, they believe that uh, Adam and maybe the earlier Enoch and the others taught their children the plan of God by memorizing these stories. What you need to know of the stories is not the arrangement of the stars. That, that's silliness. Cassiopeia, the woman chained in the chair. That's just a bent W. How do you get a woman chained in the chair? These aren't pictures. There are pictures associated with the stars, but the way you know the story is not by the picture. You need to know the names of the stars in the order of brightness. That will remind you of the story, and the story is pictured, but it's not by the arrangement of the stars. You follow me? It's, it's corruption. But uh, if you learn the names of the stars in, in the Hebrew, uh, you'll discover some astonishing things. And there's a whole study on that called the signs of the heavens, but we'll move on here. Let's get to the Psalms. That's Israel's hymnal. It's actually poetry laced with strong theology. There's a lot of theology in, in the Psalms. You know, it's interesting how today's music is different than the old classic hymns. You know, the classic hymns were just rich with theology. Many people call today's modern Christian music uh, 7-Eleven music. Seven words repeated 11 times. Uh, the Psalms are rich with theology. In the Hebrew, the word for the book is called Tehillim. It's uh, praises. There are 55 of these that are addressed directly to the chief magician. They were intended to be sung. And uh, in the Greek, the term of the book was called sal uh, salmoi, which is a poem to be sung to a stringed instrument, or a psalter for a harp or stringed instrument. And it's out of that that we get the English word psalms. But in any case, the nature of poetry. See, we're used to poetry that's phonetic in its design. We have rhyme, which involves the parallelism of sound. The, the, there's also a paralliz parallelism of rhythm, or, metra, or, or meter, parallelism of time. There's also the, the conceptual design of, the, of poetry can also involve the parallelism of the ideas. And that's especially true of the book of Proverbs. And uh, these parallelisms can be comparative to illuminate something. They can be contrastive to be antithetic, in other words, opposites. Or they can be completive to be synthetic. Also, throughout the Psalms, you find some interesting words. You find the word selah. Some people say that's a musical, they, they speculate that that's a musical term. No, it's a pause intended for you to connect some ideas that may not be obvious. And uh, the word Selah, see it's commonly assumed that's a musical instruction. However, Selah is to connect subject matter, not music. It's, it, it connects the end of one strophe to, uh, with the beginning of the next. It's connecting the two subjects together. And uh, so it's uh, sometimes synthetic, sometimes antithetic. It's concerned with truth, not tunes. Interesting issue. Sources of the Psalms, 73 of them are assigned to David. About 50 of them are anonymous, and there's a number of others to various people. His, his choir director, Asaph, the, his choir director, and a few other guys here. Uh, even one to Moses, by the way. But um, some people classify the Psalms into five categories. There's a group of, of uh, Psalms that are about man. They sometimes call it the Genesis book. There's a group of Psalms that have to do with deliverance. They call it the Exodus book. Some people do. There's also a whole group of psalms that are, deal with the sanctuary, Levitical, some people associate with. There's another group of unrest or wandering, so they associate with numbers. And there's the final, the word of the Lord. Uh, and so some people try to cluster these hymns in those five categories. I mentioned just so you're aware of it. I don't happen to see them that way, but that's okay. Uh, many of them have inscriptions. There are 34 without any inscriptions, 52 with simple inscriptions, 14 with his, that tie them to history, specific historical incidents. There's four that are inscribed with a, denoting a purpose. There are 15 that are called songs of degrees. I'll come back to those. And, th and there's 31 special ones for the 150 psalms. And there's a whole bunch of terms I won't go through, but there's a whole bunch of terms all through here that most scholars assume or believe they're somehow related to the execution of the music or dancing or their technical terms for stringed instruments or uh, various other issues. So, but those I might warn you that the, the scholars are very much... Uh, still in a debate on what some of them really Im imply. But in ha the book of Habakkuk, we find a psalm in the book, and it also teaches us some things that may surprise us. 
The psalm has, in Habakkuk has a superscription, something in front of it, in other words. It says, a prayer of Habakkuk, the, the prophet upon the Shigenoth, which is a, a, like crying aloud. It's an exclamation. It ha- then there's the psalm itself. From ver- it, this is all in chapter 3 of Habakkuk, from verse 2 to 19. Then the end of that, it says, to the chief magician upon Nigenoth, which is on stringed instruments, is what it apparently means. But what's interesting, these superscription and subscriptions here betray a pattern that we didn't realize for many of the psalms. And we'll discover that many of the psalms, the inscription is not really the superscription of the following psalm, it's really a, a tale of the previous one. See, there's, a, there's some tra- translational uh, difficulties here. And Hezekiah also has a psalm in his book, Hezekiah 38. The superscription is the writing of Hezekiah, the king of Judah, when he was, had been sick and was recovered from his sickness. sickness. It's up front. Then there's the psalm itself for 10 verses. And then the subscription. Therefore, we will sing my song to the string instruments. That pattern is consistent in Habakkuk and Hezekiah. And people are beginning to realize that maybe that's the way the psalm should have been. And these subscriptions and inscriptions are, are, are maybe misascribed. Now, the songs of degrees is in Psalms 120 to 134. And it's sometimes called the ascents because there's 15 steps. And they sang these as they went up the 15 steps. That's one view. Uh, Hezekiah was the most godliest of Judah's kings in 2 Kings 18. He wrote many psalms and proverbs, one's even in his book. He restored temple worship in 2 Chronicles 29. And in fact, he was given 15 additional years to his life by God, and that was confirmed to him by he going out and looking at Ahab's sundial, a monument that was nearby, and seeing that go back 15 degrees, as what God's confirming that he was going to get 15 more years. And many people associate that with the 15 psalms that call the psalms of ascents. And so there's that, that at least tradition about it. But the most interesting group for some people are the Messianic Psalms. There's a handful of them. The book of Psalms is, the, is quoted in the New Testament more than any other book of the Old Testament. And the, they, the, the, the things that are in the Psalms constitute irrefutable testimony to the divine inspiration of the Scriptures because it lays out details well in advance of the facts. Psalm 2, 8, 16, 22, 23, 24... 40, 41, 45, 68, 69, 87 and 89, 102, 110, and it goes on and on and on that are labeled Messianic Psalms because they embody some prophecies that are fulfilled in the life of Christ and uh, His person. The fact that He's Son of God is mentioned in the half a dozen of them. That He's Son of Man in Psalm 8 and following. Son of David in several places. His offices as prophet in several places. As priest in Psalm 110. Uh, his, as king in Psalm 2 and others. We'll look at Psalm 2 in a minute. Um, he, uh, the fact that he would speak in parables, that he would calm the storm, that he'd be despised, rejected, mocked, whipped, and derided, all expressed in the Psalms, that he'd be impaled on a cross. In fact, it's so graphic, it sounds like it was dictated first person singular as he hung on the cross. That he'd be thirsty, the wine mixed with gall, they'd, they'd cast lots for his uh, garments, and that not a bone would be broken, that he'd fulfill the Passover specifications. That he'd rise from the dead, he'd send to heaven, he'd be right hand of God, that, he, that he's our high priest, that he'll judge the nations, he'll reign, his reign to be eternal, he's the son of God, the son of David, that people would sing Hosanna to him, that he'd be blessed forever and it would come glory in the last days. It goes on and on. These are all in the Psalms. You could build a whole presentation of Christ from the Psalms. In the coming kingdom in Psalm 46 through tribulation, the range of the kingdom in Psalm 47 and all the earth, and the center of the kingdom. Psalm 46, 47, 48 speaks of the kingdom. It's It's coming, it's range, and it's center. And uh, so we see design here. The shepherd psalms, we're all familiar with that. The suffering savior in Psalm 22, hanging on the cross. The good shepherd, analogous to the good shepherd discourse in John 10. The living shepherd in Psalm 23, we've all heard that. The great shepherd in Hebrews 13 is a parallel. The exalted sovereign of Psalm 24, 22, 23, and 24. And the chief shepherd in 1 Peter 5, 4, and so on. So... uh, Psalm 22, is just, let's just take, we'll take a couple of these, take a quick look at them. The, it opens up, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That all echoes in our ears is that one of the first things Christ said on the cross, right? Eli, Eli, lama thabachthani. And uh, it's interesting that David is penning this. David was never in any danger of crucifixion. He was never in any extremity in that regard. How did he get inspired to write this? It, 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 it's words that... It's almost as if it was dictated while Jesus hung on the cross. Crucifixion was invented 700 years after this was penned. Adopted by, it, was, it was invented by the Persians. That's what Haman, what says hanged in your translation is wrong. He was impaled. The Persians did that. The Romans really adopted that and used it very widely, obviously. See, Israel's method of execution was stoning. 
How did you get this insight? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip and they shake the head saying, He trusted in the Lord that He would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing He delighted in him. These taunts are virtually quoted as you find them in Matthew 27, verse 43 and 46. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot stirred. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Heavy stuff. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and they cast lots for, upon my vesture. That's not like it's quote of Matthew 27, verse 35. Let's go to the, psalm, the next psalm, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. We all know, we've all heard this psalm. I shall not want. It means I shall not lack nothing. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, which means I shall not lack provision. He leads me beside the still waters. It means I shall not lack peace. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. I shall not lack guidance. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I shall not lack courage in the dark hour. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. See, I shall not lack true comfort. Thou preparedest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. I shall not lack protection, preservation, honor. And I, thou anointest my head with oil. I shall never lack joy. The oil speaks of joy. I shall, my cup runneth over. I shall never lack fullness of blessing. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I shall not lack divine favor during my earthly life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I shall not lack a heavenly home when my earthly tour is over. Incredible psalm. We've all heard it. Never tire of it. You really get to appreciate the psalms when you go through the dark valleys. There are psalms that may not mean much to you now. They will when you retreat to them in times of stress. Now, there's seven compound titles of God in the Bible. Jehovah Yireh, which is the Lord will provide. Yahweh Yerapha, the Lord healeth. Yahweh Shalom, the Lord our peace. Yahweh Tzitkanu, the Lord our righteousness. Yahweh Shama, the Lord ever present. Yahweh Nitsi, the Lord our banner. Yahweh Ra'ah, the Lord our shepherd. And each one of these is in the psalm. Each one of these is in the psalm, in effect. E each one of these names of God are dwelled here. But I want to talk about Psalm 2. It's one of the most strangest psalms. Psalm 2, the second psalm. You need to take this down on your notes and figure out who's talking to who. There's three guys having a conversation here. And I'll let the cat out of the bag. I believe it's the Holy Spirit, the Father, and the Son. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Who's talking here? Holy Spirit, I believe. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall He speak unto them in His wrath and vex them in His sore displeasure. Boy, boy, boy. Now the next verse, verse 6, I think is the Father speaking. Yea, I have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And then I believe the Son is now speaking, quoting the Father. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen of, for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. I believe the Son is quoting the Father. The Father said that, and the Son's quoting him. You follow me? Be wise, now the Holy Spirit takes over again. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and ye perish from the way when His wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in Him. Strange war council. It's the Trinity talking to themselves, I believe. And they're talking about the, earth, the kings of the earth coming, taking up war against them and how silly and futile that's going to be. And God is going to, to express His displeasure. I believe this is the heavenly side of Armageddon and the second coming and all of that. There are other psalmic groups. There's the Hallelujah Psalms, a handful of those. There's the Penitential Psalms, the Imprecatory Psalms, the Acrostic Psalms. There's even Psalm 119, which has 22 sections, one for each Hebrew letter, and every line in that section starts with that Hebrew letter. It has a section of six, each section is 16 lines with eight couplets, each couplet beginning with the same letter of the Hebrew alphabet. 
Incredible design in these things. Well, let's move on. We, uh, we can't spend, we, we could, we will at a separate time spend more time on the Psalms, but here's the book of Proverbs. Proverbs are not hymns, they're prudence through precept. You see, Psalms is aimed at a devotional life. Proverbs is aimed at our practical life. And uh, pro, for, verba, words. It's a, it, the term refers to a very terse maxim. Little, separate little maxims. See, a, pro, a proverb does not argue, it simply assumes. Solomon wrote 3,000 of these, according to 1 Kings 4. They were arranged, we believe, during the reign of Hezekiah. The organization is pretty simple. They extol wisdom, 15 sonnets rather than Proverbs. There are two monologues. There are maxims enjoining prudence. There's 375 aphorisms with couplets, 16 epigrams. Unless you're into rhetoric, this probably doesn't mean a lot to you. There are more maxims on prudence, 7 epigrams, 55 couplets, 13 says of Agur. There's an oracle, oracle of Lemuel's mother, an acrostic on the virtuous woman, which we will take a look at. The structural method is they're contrastive proverbs, they're antithetical, compact presentation of some kind of contrast, striking contrast. There are completed proverbs, these are where the second line agrees or carries or amplifies the first. See, they're not, there isn't a standard pattern. Sometimes they're offsets, sometimes they, sub, they, 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 sometimes they contrast, sometimes they complete. And then there's comparative proverbs, they're figures of comparison. And very colorful imagery. Let's, you know, a fair woman without discretion is like a jewel of gold in a swine's snout. <laughs> that's descriptive. And that's obviously a contrast, right? Then there's a completed one. As cold water to a thirsty soul is like good news from a far country. Boy, it captures a, a snippet of life, doesn't it? Maybe you have to have some of those experiences to really have this grab you. Uh, comparative. The tongue of a nagging woman is a continual dripping on a very rainy day. <laughs> These are colorful imagery. Pictures and analogies. The sluggard is the sluggard who is like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes of his employer. <laughs> are you one of those? No hands, please. The offended brother who is harder to win than a strong city. How interesting. How, how true that is in your family. Huh? The coming of poverty like an armed man to the slothful. Wise reproof is to an earring of gold on an obedient ear. Riches flying away on wings like those of an eagle. It's a very graphic language, very practical, very real. But here's one that we'll just look at. The Mrs. Far Above Rubies. There's a gal. And guys, you need to know this one. Proverbs 31, sorry, verse 10. Mrs. Far Above Rubies. She's a good woman. She works diligently. She contrives prudently. And she be behaves uprightly, very eloquently portrayed. She's a good wife. She seeks the husband's good. She keeps his confidence and aids his prosperity. She's a good mother. She clothes family wisely. She feeds household well. And she shops sensibly. These are all embodied in Proverbs 31. She's a good neighbor. She helps the poor. She uplifts the needy. And she speaks graciously. You say, there aren't any people like that. Yes, there are. I married to one. Let's move on to Ecclesiastes. The Hebrew is Koheleth, the preacher. This is written by uh, Solomon at the end of his life, and it's often misunderstood. It's his sermon on the natural man's quest for the chief good. And it's, a com it's unlike the Proverbs, which are little separate pieces, this is a cumulative treatise which has component parts. And the final conclusion is that all is vanity, but what he's talking about are things under the sun, the material world. It is not pessimistic, it is simply bravely honest, and it has a surprising conclusion that many people miss. You see, it sees beyond life's ironies and wearing repetitions. It sees beyond that to the divine control and future restitutions. You, you, don't, you don't catch that unless you watch very carefully. The book of Ecclesiastes. He starts out with his quest by personal experiment. He searched for wisdom and pleasure by personal experiment. Then he quested uh, uh, for, uh, by general observation, ills and enigmas of human society, all leading to frustration. Then his quest was by practical morality and discovered that material things cannot satisfy the soul. And somehow we have to keep learning that over and over again. The quest uh, reviewed and concluded in the end. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity is his conclusion. There are ten vanities. Human wisdom, wise and foolish alike have the same end, the death. 
Human labor, the worker is no better than the shirker in the final end, he says. Human purpose, man proposes but God disposes. Human rivalry, success brings more envy than joy. Human avarice, much feeds the lust for the elusive more. Much feeds the lust for the elusive more. Human fame, brief, uncertain, and soon forgotten. Fame is brief, but infamy lasts a little longer. Human insatiety, money does not satisfy, it only feeds others. Human coveting, gain cannot be enjoyed despite desire. Human frivolity, one only camouflages an inevitable sad end. Human awards, good and bad often get wrong desserts. Here's the conclusion of the matter. Here's his final significance. Listen carefully what Solomon's saying. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. That astonishes many people. Yes, it sounds real pessimistic. He's just coming. There's nothing new under the sun. He's talking about natural life. It's de destined for frustration. Here's a guy who knew. He'd been at the top. He'd experienced it all. And it's all vanity. It's all emptiness. The only thing that counts is to fear God. This is, the, this is his, at the end of the days, he looks back um, and assesses the wreckage of his life and realizes that's where, this is where it's all at. Well, let's get to the sex appeal. Song of Songs. Now, this is a book that many people get very, uh, either don't know at all or get very embarrassed reading. <laughs> its theme is ultimate love. That's its theme. No book of the Scripture has given rise to more commentaries and opinions than this one. Some say it's an allegory. Some say it's an extended type. Some say it's a drama involving two, some say three main characters. Some say it's a collection of Syrian wedding songs. And uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, I, I go on and on. But I want to point out the book is inspired. There are a lot of views. The Jewish tradition is that the Mishnah and the Talmud and the Targum all view the book as an, an allegorical picture of the love of God for Israel. That's the view. There are other rabbis that believe it's a handbook for uh, sexual intercourse, husband and wife. Both are true. The church leaders, Hippolytus, uh, Oregon, Jerome, Athanasius, Augustine, and others viewed the book as an allegory of Christ's love for the bride and the church. And it is. It's all of the above. It's a very, very interesting book. It's a very practical handbook on uh, sexual practice. It is a book of God's relationship with Israel. It's also a book that uh, can have application as an allegory to Christ's thing. But uh, the key, of course, is Psalm 45, a song of loves, a royal marriage hymn, and a heavenly bridegroom's involved. So let's get that in mind. So... Some say it's a suite of seven idols. An idol is a little picture. It comes from the Greek idyllium, which uh, comes from third century a Sicilian poet. And that's, that's if you're into in, in, interested in structure. But there's, there's seven elements to this that make up the story. But let's cut through this and actually look at the story. Let's look. It's actually an opera. And let's look at the story behind the opera. Solomon is the hero of the piece. And Shulamit is the Cinderella of the piece, if you will. Uh, Shulamit is simply the feminine of Solomon. It's, it's Mr. and Mrs. Solomon is what the terms imply. In the mountain district of Ephraim, uh, King Solomon had a vineyard. And that's in chapter 8, verse 11 of this thing. And he led it out to an Ephraimite family of, uh, as keepers. The husband and father apparently had passed away, and there was a mother and at least two sons and two daughters. And the older daughter, called Shulamit, is uh, the Cinderella, is the piece, as they say. Her brothers did not appreciate her, and... Uh, fostered all kinds of hard tasks upon her, uh, denying her the privilege that a growing girl might be expected to uh, uh, enjoy in a Jewish home. He, she says, my mother's sons were angry with me. That makes it sound like maybe they were half-brothers, okay? And uh, in any case, uh, they didn't appreciate her. And, and uh, she says, my own vineyard I have not kept. In other words, she had no opportunity to look after her own interests. She's so busy with the tasks that they put on. So uh, we also get the impression that she had no opportunity to look after herself. She's probably sunburned, but very naturally attractive. Well, finally, a handsome stranger shows up, and uh, a shepherd, a stranger shepherd of some kind, and he views her as without blemish. Friendship ripens to affection and finally to love, and he promises to return and to make her his bride. He leaves. His brother, the brothers are skeptical. They taunt her. They regard her as being deceived by this stranger. 
He's gone a long time. And uh, she would dream of him in darkness and, and uh, just trusted him, despite the time as it wore on. Then one day, a huge cavalcade arrives with attendants of all kinds. The king has sent for you. In obedience, of course, she responds. And when she looks into his face, guess who? The king was the shepherd that had won her heart. And that's where she declares, I am my beloved's and his desire is toward me. So that's the, that's the big climax of the thing. I'm my beloved and his desire is toward me. So that's the opera. And uh, now, there are people that suspect this really was Solomon and a gal by the name of Abishag. Abishag was a beautiful young woman who spent her youth in the fields and vineyards and she was selected, young gal, attractive gal, to lie beside elderly King David and serve his needs during his dying years. And she came from an area called Shunem, probably in Galilee, but they're not really sure. The text, by the way, is very clear that she, her virginity was not violated. She wasn't there to give him sexual favors, although she, uh, he, he declined to do that. He, uh, it was clear that uh, he, his, her ministry to him was strictly one of uh, physical care, not sexual pr pleasure. But, uh, uh, and, and that's in 1 Kings. Uh, but Solomon became deeply attracted to her. Adonijah tried to take her to wife, but Solomon had him executed. He was enraged and had him executed. So Solomon's got his eye on this guy. And uh, so he... Uh, See, Solomon was part of the household at the time that all this happened with David. Abishag was a country girl, a natural beauty, and uh, she probably worked in the fields, probably sunburned, but very, very naturally come, not used to expensive clothes, that sort of thing, from some of the remarks and so forth, and uh, not the exotics of nobility, but uh, natural beauty, uh, sort of like my, my nan. But, so that's a possibility, and we have just gone through a rather hurriedly uh, skimming uh, a tough time. We've gone through, <laughs> gone through 150 psalms, <laughs> We've gone through a couple of very tough books that are usually misunderstood by the commentators. But I, I can't help but uh, see this. I, I was enamored with the summary by Henry Van Dyke. Uh, he said, it has woven its, speaking of the poetical books, it has woven itself into our dearest dreams so that love, friendship, sympathy, devotion, memory, hope put on the beautiful garments of its treasured speech. No man is poor or desolate who has this treasure for his own. When the landscape darkens and the trembling pilgrim comes to the valley of the shadow, he's not afraid to enter. He takes the rod and staff of Scripture in his hand. He says to friend and comrade, Goodbye, we shall meet again. And comforted by that support, he goes toward the lonely pass as one who walks through darkness into light. I like that as one person's reaction. Job, of course, is an incredible book to study in several levels. Each one of these that we've reviewed in this last hour are really devotional books. They're poetical books. They're not history in the usual sense, although there's much history hidden in there. There's also scientific little tidbits here and there. There's messianic prophecies hidden there. But the real strength and resource of all the books we talked about, uh, especially the Psalms, uh, is comfort in times of stress. There will be times of stress. And some of these you won't even appreciate until you've been through times of stress. But it's something that uh, will become very, very dear. You might just, uh, that's why it is an incredibly good spiritual hygiene as you have your devotional reading, whatever that may. You should, you should be going through the Bible at your own, in your own style, but include in each morning or each evening a psalm as a front end or a back end to your, your study time. Uh, it'll be, uh, it'll be uh, uh, some of your most precious moments of the day. I might comment just briefly uh, on a couple of other things. There are lots of ways. There's a, there's a difference between studying the Bible, grabbing your commentaries, getting your resources, finding out who is what, and going through all that stuff expositionally. And that's great. That's a place for that. And that should be serious study time. But there's another aspect of the Word of God that many of us fail to be diligent on, and that is just devotional, just to bathe in it. Just bathe in it. Right on through not trying to necessarily uh, deal with some of the, the, the paradoxes and details, just, just to bathe in it. And uh, God will, that is the way God will speak to you, through His Word. And uh, it's uh, um, one of the things that uh, uh, 
I, I've found the most useful. So, some people like to just t take the Bible and read, say, three chapters a day or some, some pace so they get through the Bible once a year, once every two years, whatever. Different, there's different reading things. And that's, that's, that's not bad. Uh, I've been drawn to a little different style. I keep an electronic Bible with me which has bookmarks in it. And uh, what I like to do is have a bookmark in the Torah, a bookmark in the historical books, a bookmark in the poetical books, a bookmark in the prophets, a bookmark in the Gospels. I use Acts as if it was a Gospel. And in the Torah, I treat Joshua as if it was the Torah, but that's mechanics. And uh, anyway, the, the Gospels, the Epistles, and the Book of Revelation. There's about eight of those. And what I try to do is move each bookmark one chapter a day. And, uh, and what, the reason I find that so different, it's, it's sort of like a, a, a meal. You don't eat your meat on Mondays and your potatoes on Tuesdays and your vegetables on Wednesdays. You like a more balanced diet. And uh, uh, I got this, uh, got this basic idea from my wife because she, she has her Bible just oozes bookmarks. She's into all kinds of things. And uh, I have found that awkward because I have a Bible at home that I, uh, that I use for study, but I don't want to take it on trips for a lot of reasons. But uh, when I got the electronic one, it worked out real neat because I can just move the bookmarks. And it also allows me that way when I, if I'm 15 minutes early for an appointment for a barbershop or something, I just pop it open and knock off one or two of the book, you know, one of the two chapters. And, uh, but what's neat about it is it, 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 the, the particular pace I've set for myself takes me through the New Testament twice a year and the Old Testament, no, three times a year, to New, to, and the Old Testament twice a year. But that's a lot of reading. You may not, you can adjust it to your own style. But, that kind of reading isn't study, it's just bathing in it. And it's the way that the Bible increasingly becomes your own, and it's also the way God can use it to speak to you. And that's, especially, that's true of all the books, whether even the Torah, or obviously, or the, the historical books, and certainly the prophets, but it's especially true with the books we just went through, the poetical books. They're comfort, they're warm. And, and uh, uh, they're, they're, this, is, this is another place, by the way, where the majesty of the King James appeals to me. Some people find that difficult, the Old English. They prefer one of the modern translations. And that's fine, because we're not talking about study here. We're not talking about, you know, building doctrine. We're not, uh, we're just talking about bathing in it. And, uh, and I encourage you to, to do that and see what God's going to do. Well, the next time we meet, the next session will be hour nine. And we're going to take the book of Daniel, and, uh, which is on one hand a historical book, on the other hand a prophecy book. The first is 12 chapters. first six happen to be narrative, very colorful narrative. And the last half, of course, visions. But what makes the book of Daniel pivotal to many people is its focus is on the Gentile world. Most of the Bible speaks of Israel and, and, and sees the world through the lens of Israel. But the book of Daniel is actually translated, switches from Hebrew to, to uh, the Gentile language of that day from chapters 2 through 7. And it has astonishing uh, prophecies that impact you and I that are unfolding as we speak, visibly. And it'll be one of the most exciting. It is many people who <laughs> know very little else about the Bible uh, write books on the book of Daniel. It, is, it, it obviously is pivotal to understanding the book of Revelation and so forth. But in any case, uh, we're, so we're going to, we, we, all the way through, we, we can't take all the prophets in detail. We're going to pick one. So we'll we talk about all of them when we get to the prophets, but we'll take Daniel specific to get in depth. When we get to Paul's epistles, we'll take We'll talk about all the epistles in general, but we'll take one in depth, Romans. And then the Hebrew, uh, Christian, we'll take one, that's the book of Hebrews. So we'll, we, we'll, we'll, we'll poke, we'll, we'll sink some holes in depth in a couple of places. We can't do that with all the books. We'll be at this for five years. We're trying to knock this off in 24 one-hour sessions, not to exhaust the books, but to give you a perspective of the whole so you can find your way around so, the, so that the whole package will be comfortable to you and, you'll, and so you'll develop a respect for how the pieces fit together. That's really what we're after. And so, uh, and the book of Daniel will fit that because it's going to be so pivotal to understanding the Gospels and also to understand the book of Revelation. So it'll be a fun time. So let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we, we're awed at how much you love us. We thank you, Father, for giving us this heritage giving us the benefit of the comfort and the encouragement and the admonitions of these great men that went before us. We thank you for the candor of seeing their failures as well as their successes. 
And Father, we would pray that through your Holy Spirit, you would help us be exceptions and learn from these lessons. We pray, Father, that these lessons not be wasted on us, that we would understand what contributed to those failures, to understand why some of these great men stumbled and fell from what they might have been. We recognize, Father, that whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning so that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. So, Father, we just thank you for your word. We do pray, Father, that you would just continue to kindle a new fire in each of us for your word, that we each might just partake of these treasures that you vouchsafe into our care. Above all these things, Father, we pray that you would help us grow in our understanding of our Messiah, our Lord and Savior. And we also pray, Father, that you'd help each of us through your Spirit and through your Word be ever more fruitful stewards of the opportunities that you put in our path. As we, without any reservation, commit ourselves into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Son of David.